Ah, uh, yes, my little prince. This is how, bit by bit, I came to know your sad story. For a long time, your only pleasure was watching the sun set. I discovered this new detail on the fourth morning when you told me, I love sunsets. Let's go and see a sunset. But we'll have to wait. Wait for what? For the sun to set. You were very surprised at first. Then you laughed at yourself and said, I forgot where I am. I always think I'm at home. When it's midday in the United States, as everyone knows, the sun is setting over France. You get to France in a minute or so. You'll be able to watch the sunset. Unfortunately, France is much too far away. But on your tiny planet, all you had to do was move your chair a few inches and you could watch the sun go down at any time you liked. One day, I saw the sun set 44 times. And a little later you added, You know when you're as sad as I was? You love sunsets. The day you watched 44 of them, were you really that sad? But you didn't answer. On the fifth day, again thanks to the lamb, another of the little prince's secrets was revealed to me. He suddenly asked me, out of the blue, as if he had been silently mulling over the problem for some time, If lambs eat bushes, do they also eat flowers? Lambs eat whatever come their way. Even flowers with thorns? Yes, even flowers with thorns. So what's the use of thorns. But I didn't know. I was right in the middle of trying to unscrew a jammed bolt in my engine. I was very worried. It was beginning to look as though there was a serious problem and my drinking water was running out, making me feel the worst. What's the use of thorns? The little prince never let a question go once he'd asked it, but my bolt was annoying me. So I said the first thing that came into my head. Thorns are no use at all. They're just flowers' ways of being nasty. Oh! But after a moment's silence, he retorted, almost reproachfully, I don't believe you. Flowers are weak. They're also naive. They do their best to reassure themselves. They think their thorns are making them terrifying. I didn't respond. At that moment, I was thinking, if this bolt won't unscrew, I'll smash it off with a hammer. But the little prince broke my thought of train again. So, do you think flowers... No, I don't. I don't think anything. I said the first thing that came into my head. Unlike you, I have important things to worry about. He stared at me in amazement. Important things? He was looking at me. I had a hammer in my hand. My fingers were covered in grease and I was bent over an object that, to him, was extremely ugly. You sound like a grown-up. I felt a bit embarrassed, but he took no pity on me and continued. You confuse everything. You mix everything up. He was really very annoyed. His golden hair was shaking in the wind. I know a planet where there's a man with a bright red face. He has never smiled a flower. He has never gazed at a star. He has never loved anyone. He has never done anything but sums. All day long he keeps saying, like you, I am an important man. I am an important man. And that makes him big-headed. But he isn't a man, he's a puffball. A what? A puffball. By now, the little prince was white with anger. For millions of years, flowers have been growing thorns. And for millions of years, lambs have been eating flowers anyway. But it isn't important to try to understand why flowers take so much trouble to grow thorns that are never of any use. For millions of years, flowers have been growing thorns. And for millions of years, lambs have been eating flowers anyway. 
But it's not important to try and understand why flowers take so much trouble to grow thorns that are never of any use. It isn't important that lambs and flowers are at war. It isn't more important than the sums the man with the red face does. And if I, the little prince, know of a flower that is the only one like it in the universe, that doesn't exist anywhere else except on my planet, and that could be destroyed in just one go by a lamb, one morning, just like that, without the lamb even realising what it's doing. Isn't that important too? His face turned pink. Then he went on. If someone loves a flower that's unique among all the millions of stars, that's all he needs to make him happy when he looks at them. He can say to himself, my flower is up there somewhere, but if the lamb eats the flower, for him, it's as if all the stars had suddenly gone out. But that's not important. He could find nothing more to say. Suddenly, he burst into tears. Night had fallen. I had put down my tools. I could no longer care about my hammer or my bolt. The fact that I had nothing to drink, or that I was going to die. There was a little prince on a planet, on my planet, Earth, who needed comforting. I took him in my arms. I rocked him. I said to him, the flower that you love, it's not in danger. I'll draw a muzzle for your lamb. I'll draw you a shield for your flower. I'll... I didn't really know what to say. I felt very clumsy. I didn't know how to reach him, how to connect with him. Sadness is such a mysterious place. I very soon learned more about this flower. On the little prince's planet, there had always been very simple flowers, with a single row of petals, which didn't take up any space and didn't bother anyone. They appeared in the morning among the grass, and disappeared again in the evening. But one day, this flower emerged from a seed that had blown in from somewhere else. The little prince kept a close eye on the tiny shoot, which looked different from all the other tiny shoots. Perhaps it was a new species of baobab, but the plant soon stopped growing and started getting ready to flower. As he watched an enormous bud develop, the little prince was convinced that something miraculous was about to appear, but hidden in her green cocoon, the flower simply continued preparing to be beautiful. She carefully chose her colours, she slowly put on her clothes, and one by one, she adjusted her petals. She didn't want to come out all crinkled like a poppy. She wanted to emerge resplendent in all of her glory. Oh, yes. She was a very vain flower. So her secret preparations went on for days and days. And then, one morning, just as the sun came up, she revealed herself. And having worked so hard for so long, she yawned and said, Oh, I'm not even awake. Please excuse me. My hair is still a mess. But the little prince couldn't contain his delight. How beautiful you are. Yes, aren't I? replied the flower sweetly. And look, I've come out at the same time as the sun. The little prince realised that the flower was none too modest but how good she made him feel. Oh, I do believe it's time for breakfast, said the flower soon afterwards. Would you be kind enough to spare a thought for me? And the little prince was all embarrassed and went to fill a watering can with fresh water which he sprinkled on the flower. And so she was soon tormenting him with her vanity and capriciousness. One day, for example, referring to her four thorns, she said to the little prince, Even tigers could not attack me with their claws. There aren't any tigers on my planet, objected the little prince. In any case, tigers don't eat grass. I'm not grass, 
replied the flower sweetly. Oh, forgive me. I may not be afraid of tigers, but I can't stand drafts. You wouldn't have a windbreak, would you? A plant that can't stand drafts? What sort of plant is that? thought the little prince. Oh, this flower is much too complicated. In the evenings, you are to put a dome over me. It's cold on your planet. It's not in a good location. Where I come from? But she broke off. She had arrived as a seed. How could she have known anything about other worlds? Ashamed at being caught fabricating such a childish lie, she coughed too or three times to make the little prince feel guilty. And the wind break? I was about to fetch it, but you were talking to me. Then she coughed a little harder to make him feel sorry anyway. And so, despite wanting to show how much he loved her, the little prince soon became suspicious of the flower. He had taken her empty words seriously, and now he was very unhappy. I shouldn't have listened to her, he confided in me one day. You should never listen to flowers. You should look at them and smell them. Mine filled my planet with fragrance, but I was unable to enjoy it. That business about tigers should have made me feel sorry for her, but it only annoyed me. He confided in me another time. Oh, how stupid I was. I should have judged her on her actions, not on her words. She gave me her fragrance. She lit up my world. I should never have run away. I should have realised that her silly games were a sign of affection. Flowers are so full of contradictions. But I was too young to know how to love her. I think it was a flock of migrating birds that gave him an opportunity to get away. The morning before he left, he tidied the whole planet. First, he carefully swept his active volcanoes. He had two active volcanoes, which were really handy for heating his breakfast in the mornings. He also had a dormant volcano, but as he always said, you never know. So he swept the dormant volcano as well. If they're swept regularly, volcanoes burn gently and steadily without ever erupting. Volcanic eruptions are like chimney fires. They are the result of neglect. Obviously, here on Earth, our volcanoes are much too big for us to sleep. That is why they cause us so many problems. Next, with some sadness, the little prince pulled up the new baobab shoots. He thought he would never be going back. Yet, that morning, all of these familiar tasks seemed unusually reassuring. And when he had watered the flower for the last time, and went to fetch the dome to put over her, he suddenly felt like crying. Goodbye, he said to the flower. But she didn't reply. Goodbye, he said again. The flower coughed, but not because she had a cold. I've been foolish. She said at last, please forgive me and try to be happy. He wasn't surprised that she hadn't reproached him. He stood there with the dome at the ready, not knowing what to think. He couldn't understand why she was so kind and calm. Yes, I love you, said the flower. You never knew. That was my fault. It really doesn't matter. But you were as foolish as I was. Try to be happy. Put the dome down. I don't want it anymore. But what about the wind? My cough isn't as bad as all that. The cool night air will do me good. I'm a flower. But what about all the pugs and animals? If you can't put up with two or three caterpillars, how will I ever know what a butterfly is like? I hear they're very beautiful. In any case, who else will come and see me? You'll be a long, long way away. And as for animals, I have nothing to fear. I have my own claws. And she innocently showed her four thorns. 
Then she said, Don't stand around like that. It's annoying. You decided to leave, so go. Because she didn't want him to see her cry. She was a very proud flower. The little prince's planet was near asteroids 325, 326, 327, 328, 329, and 330. So, he started by visiting these in search of an occupation and in pursuit of knowledge. The first of them was inhabited by a king. He was dressed in full regalia, all crimson and ermine, and sat on a very simple yet majestic throne. Ah, here comes a subject, exclaimed the king when he saw the little prince. And the little prince thought, how can he know who I am when he has never seen me before? He didn't know that for a king, things are very simple. Everyone is a subject. Come closer so that I can see you better, said the king. He was very proud to have someone to rule over. The little prince looked around for somewhere to sit, but the entire planet was smothered by the king's magnificent ermine cloak. So he remained standing, and, being tired, he yawned. It is contrary to etiquette to yawn in the presence of the king, said the monarch. I forbid it. I can't help it, replied the little prince with great embarrassment. I've had a long journey and I haven't slept. In that case, said the king, I command you to yawn. I haven't seen anyone yawn for years. Yawns are rather a rarity around here. Go ahead, yawn again. I command you. Now you're intimidating me. I can't do it again, said the little prince, blushing deeply. Well now, replied the king. In that case, I... I command you to sometimes yawn and to sometimes... He mumbled something and seemed frustrated. You see, for the king, the most important thing was that people should respect his authority, but he could not tolerate disobedience. He was an absolute ruler, but since he was also a good man, he wanted his commands to be reasonable. If I were to command, he continued, if I were to command a general to turn into a seabird, and if the general failed to obey, it would not be the general's fault, it would be my fault. May I sit down? asked the prince timidly. I command you to sit down, replied the king, majestically gathering up a corner of his ermine cloak. But the little prince was amazed. The planet was minuscule. What could he possibly rule over? Your majesty, he said, please excuse me for asking, but I command you to ask, said the king hastily. Your majesty, what do you rule over? Over everything, replied the king plainly. Over everything? The king made a modest gesture that encompassed his own planet and the other planets and the stars. Over all that, said the little prince. Over all that, replied the king. For not only was he an absolute ruler, he was also ruler of the universe. And do the stars obey you? Of course, said the king. They obey me instantly. I will not tolerate indiscipline. The little prince was amazed by the king's power. If it were his, he could watch not just forty-eight, but seventy-two, or even a hundred, or a hundred and two sunsets in one day, without even having to move his chair. And as he was feeling rather sad at the thought of having abandoned his own planet, he decided to risk asking the king a favour. I'd like to see a sunset. Would you be kind enough to command the sun to set? If I were to command a general to fly from flower to flower like a butterfly, or to write a tragedy, or to turn into a seabird, and if the great general failed to execute the command I have given him, which of us, he or I, would be at fault? You would be, said the little prince firmly. Precisely. One must ask of each person what the person can give, continued the king. Authority rests primarily on reasonableness. If you command your people to go and throw themselves into the sea, they will revolt. I have the right to demand obedience because my commands are reasonable. But what about my sunset? 
repeated the little prince, who never let a question go once he had asked it. You shall have your sunset. I shall demand it, but, in accordance with the science of government, I shall wait until the conditions are favourable. When will that be? inquired the little prince. Well now, replied the king, consulting a large calendar, well now, it will be about, at about, it will be this evening, at about twenty minutes to eight, and you shall see how promptly I am obeyed. The little prince yawned. He was sorry he would miss the sunset, but he was getting rather bored. There's nothing more for me to do here, he told the king. I'm going to move on. Don't go, replied the king, who was so pleased to have a subject. Don't go. I'll make you a minister. A minister of what? Of, of justice. But there's no one to judge. We don't know that said the king. I haven't yet been all around my kingdom. I am very old and walking tires me, but there is nowhere to keep a coach. Oh, but I've already looked, said the little prince, leaning over for another glance at the other side of the planet. There's no one over there either. Then you shall judge yourself, replied the king. That is far more difficult. It is much more difficult to judge yourself than to judge others. If you can judge yourself properly, it means that you have true wisdom. But, said the little prince, I can judge myself anywhere. I don't have to stay here. Well now, said the king, I do believe that somewhere on my planet there is an old rat. I hear it at night. You will be able to judge that. You will condemn it to death from time to time, so that its life depends on your judgment. But, each time, you will pardon it in the interest of practicality, as it is the only one. But I don't like condemning things to death, replied the little prince, and I really think I should be going now. No, said the king. But the little prince, who was now ready to depart, didn't want to upset the old king. If your majesty would like to be obeyed without hesitation, he might give me a reasonable command. He might command me, for example, to leave within one minute. It was seen that the conditions are favourable. When the king did not reply, the little prince hesitated for a moment, and then, with a sigh, he took off. You shall be my ambassador, cried the king hastily, with an air of great authority. Grown-ups are really strange, said the little prince to himself, as he continued on his journey. The second planet he came to was inhabited by a shoah. Aha! Here comes an admirer, exclaimed the shoah, as soon as he saw the little prince approaching. Because, to a shoah, other people are admirers. Hello, said the little prince. <laughs> What's a funny hat you're wearing? It's for raising, replied the shoah. I raise it when I'm applauded. The shoah raised his hat and gave a modest bow. This is more fun than being with the king, thought the little prince, and he clapped his hands again. The show-off raised his hat again and took another bow. After five minutes of this monotonous game, the little prince was starting to get bored. And what do I need to do, he asked, to make you drop your hat? But the show-off didn't hear him. Show-offs only ever hear praise. How much do you admire me? He asked the little prince. What does admire mean? It means to acknowledge that I am the handsomest, best dressed, richest and most intelligent person on the planet. But, but you're the only person on the planet. Be a good boy and admire me anyway. I admire you, said the little prince, shrugging his shoulders slightly. But what good will it do you? And the little prince flew off. Grown-ups really are very odd, he said to himself, as he continued on his journey. The next planet was inhabited by a drunkard. The little prince spent only a short time there, but it was enough to plunge him into a deep sadness. What are you doing? 
he asked the drunkard, who was sitting in silence between a collection of empty bottles and a collection of full bottles. I'm drinking, replied the drunkard dismally. Why are you drinking? asked the little prince. To forget, said the drunkard. But to forget what? inquired the little prince, who already felt sorry for him. To forget that that I am ashamed, confessed the drunkard, bowing his head. Ashamed of what? asked the little prince, who wanted to help him. Ashamed of drinking, concluded the drunkard, who then sank into silence, as if there was nothing more to say. And the little prince flew off, bewildered. Grown-ups really are very, very odd, he said to himself, as he continued on his journey. The fourth planet belonged to a businessman. He was such a busy man that he didn't even look up when the little prince landed. Hello, said the little prince. Um, your cigarette has gone out. Two plus two is five. Five plus seven is twelve. Twelve plus three is fifteen. Oh, hello. Fifteen plus seven is twenty-two. Twenty-two plus six is twenty-eight. Oh, there's no time to relight it. Twenty-six plus five is thirty-one. <sighs> that comes to five hundred and one. Million six hundred and twenty-two thousand seven hundred and thirty-one. Five hundred million. What? Huh? Are you still here? Five hundred and one million. Oh, I can't remember. I'm too busy. I'm an important person, you know. I don't have time for idle chatter. T plus five is seven. Five hundred million. What? Replied the little prince, who had never in his life let a question go once he had asked it. The businessman looked up. In the 54 years I've lived on this planet, I've only been disturbed three times. The first time was 22 years ago, when a bug flew in from God knows where. It made such a dreadful noise. I made four mistakes in one column. The second time was 11 years ago, when I had an attack of rheumatism. I'm an important person, you know. And the third time was just now. Where was I? Yes, five hundred and one million. A million what? The businessman realised he had no hope of being left in peace. Of those little things you sometimes see in the sky. Flies? No, no. Those little shiny things. Bees? No, no. Those little yellow things that idle people dream about. But I'm an important person, you know. I don't have time for daydreaming. Oh, you mean stars. Yes, that's right, stars. And what are you going to do with 500 million stars? 501,622,731. I'm an important man, you know. I have to be precise. I really hope I said that number right. <laughs> and what are you going to do with all those stars? What am I going to do with them? Yes. Nothing. I own them. You own the stars? Yes. But I've just met a king who... Kings don't own anything. They just reign over things. It's not the same at all. And what's the point of owning stars? Well, it makes me rich. And what's the point of being rich? So that I can buy other stars if anybody finds any. This man, thought the little prince is about as logical as the drunkard. Nevertheless, he kept on asking questions. How can you own the stars? Who do you think they belong to? retorted the businessman technically. I don't know. No one? Then they belong to me, because I thought of it first. Is that all you have to do? Of course. If you find a diamond that doesn't belong to anyone, it's yours. If you find an island that doesn't belong to anyone, it's yours. If you have an idea that no one else has had, you patent it, it's yours. And I own the stars because no one else has ever thought of owning them. That's true, said the little prince. And what do you do with them? Well, I manage them, I count them, then I count them again, said the businessman. It's not easy, but I'm an important person. 
the little prince still wasn't satisfied. But if I own a scarf, I can put it around my neck and wear it. If I own a flower, I can pick it and take it somewhere. But you can't pick stars. No, but I can bank them. What does that mean? It means that I write down on a piece of paper how many stars I own. Then I lock the piece of paper in a drawer. Is that all? That's all there is to it. It might be amusing, thought the little prince. It's also quite clever, but it's not very important. The little prince had very different ideas about what was important from those of grown-ups. Well, he went on, I own a flower, which I water every day. I own three volcanoes, which I sweep every week. You see, I also sweep the dormant one. You never know. By owning my volcanoes and my flower, I can be of use to them, but you are of no use to the stars. The businessman opened his mouth, but could think of nothing to say, and the little prince flew off. Grown-ups really are totally bizarre, he said to himself, as he continued on his journey. The fifth planet was very peculiar. It was the smallest of them all. There was just enough room on it for a street lamp and a lamp lighter. The little prince could not comprehend what purpose could be served. Here, in the middle of the sky, on a planet without any houses or people, by a street lamp and a lamp lighter. However, he said to himself, This man may be absurd, but he's less absurd than the king, or the show-off, or the businessman, or the drunkard. At least what he does makes some sense. When he lights his lamp, it's as if he's creating a new star, or a new flower. When he puts up the lamp, the flower or the star goes to sleep. It's a beautiful occupation. It's truly useful, because it is beautiful. When he landed on the planet, he greeted the lamplighter respectfully. Good morning. Why have you just put on your lamp? It's my duty, replied the lighter. Good morning. What's your duty? To put out my lamp. Good evening. And then he lit it again. But why have you just lit it again? It's my duty, replied the lighter. I don't understand, said the little prince. There's nothing to understand, said the lighter. A duty is a duty. Good morning. And he put out his lamp. Then he mopped his brow with a red checked handkerchief. This is a terrible job. It was all right before. I put it out in the morning and lit it in the evening. The rest of the day I could relax, and the rest of the night I could sleep. So, since then your duty has changed? My duty hasn't changed, said the lighter. That's the whole problem. The planet has revolved faster and faster each year, and the duty hasn't changed. So, said the little prince. So... Now that it revolves once a minute, I don't have a second's rest. I have to light it and put it out every minute. <laughs> How funny! Your days only last a minute. It's not funny at all, said the lighter. We've already been talking for a month. A month? Yes. Thirty minutes. Thirty days. Good evening. And he relit his lamp. The little prince looked at him. He admired the lamplighter for doing his duty so diligently. He remembered the sunsets he used to go and see by moving his chair. He wanted to help his new friend. You know, I've thought of a way you can rest whenever you like. I always want to rest, said the lighter, for it is possible to be both diligent and lazy. The little prince went on. Your planet is so small. You can walk around it in three strides. All you have to do is walk slowly, and it will always be daytime. When you want to rest, you walk, and the day will last as long as you want it to. That won't be much help, said the lighter. What I like best is sleeping. Hmm, what a pity, said the little prince. 
What a pity, said the lamplighter. Good morning. He put out his lamp. This one, said the little prince to himself as he continued on his journey, this one would be looked down on by all the others. The king, the show-off, the drunkard and the businessman. Yet he's the only one I don't find ridiculous. Perhaps that's because his op occupation has to do with something other than himself. He gave a sigh of regret and said to himself, He's the only one I could have made friends with, but his planet is just too small. There is no room for both of us. What the little prince couldn't bring himself to admit was that the thing he would miss most about this planet was that he was blessed with 1,440 sunsets every 24 hours. The sixth planet was ten times as big. It was vast, and it was inhabited by an old man who wrote enormous books. Ah, here comes an explorer, he exclaimed, when he saw the little prince. The little prince sat down on the table and caught his breath for a moment. He travelled a long way by now. Where have you come from? said the old man. What's that huge book? said the little prince. What do you do here? I'm a geographer, said the old man. <laughs> What's a geographer? It's a clever person who knows the position of seas, rivers, towns, mountains and deserts. It's really interesting, said the little prince. At last, he thought, a proper occupation. And he looked around him at the geographer's planet. He had never seen such a magnificent planet. It's really beautiful, your planet. Does it have any oceans? I couldn't say, said the geographer. Oh, the little prince was disappointed. Or mountains? I couldn't say, said the geographer. Or towns or rivers or deserts? I couldn't say that either, said the geographer. But you're a geographer. That's right, said the geographer. But I am not an explorer. I don't know a single explorer. Geographers don't go out and find towns and rivers and mountains and seas and oceans and deserts. Geographers are much too important to swan around. They don't need their offices, but they invite explorers in. They ask them questions, and they write down what they say they've seen. And if one of them says he has seen something that seems interesting, the geographer asks for a character check on the explorer. Why is that? Because if the explorer was lying, it would lead to huge errors in the geographer's book. The same thing would happen if the explorer drank too much. Why is that? asked the little prince. Because drunkards see double, so the geographer would record two mountains where there was only one. I know someone, said the little prince, who wouldn't be a very good explorer. Quite possibly. So, if the explorer seems to be of good character, we then run a check on seeing the, the thing that he has discovered. Go there. No, no, that would be much too complicated. We instruct the explorer to present some evidence. If, for example, he says he has discovered a large mountain, we instruct him to bring us some large rocks. The geographer suddenly became excited. But you've come a long way. You're an explorer. You can tell me about your planet. And the geographer, who had opened his record book, began sharpening his pencil. We write down the explorer's description in pencil first. We don't write it in ink until the explorer has presented his evidence. Well, said the geographer. Oh, said the little prince. Well, my planet isn't all that interesting. It's very small. There are three volcanoes. Two active volcanoes and one dormant volcano. But you never know. Mm-hmm. You never know, said the geographer. There's also a flower. Well, we don't record flowers, said the geographer. Why is that? They're beautiful, aren't they? Because flowers are ephemeral. 
What does a pheromone mean? Atmosses, said the geographer, are the most valuable of books. They never go out of date. Mountains don't often move. Oceans very seldom run dry. The things we write about are eternal. But dormant volcanoes can wake up again, interrupted the little prince. What does ephemeral mean? Whether a volcano is asleep or awake makes no difference to us, said the geographer. What matters to us is it's a mountain. Mountains don't change. But what does ephemeral mean? repeated the little prince. He had never in his life let a question go once he had asked it. It means having a very short life. Will my flower have a very short life? Of course. My flower is ephemeral, thought the little prince. And she only has four songs to protect her against the world. And I've left her all alone on my planet. This was his first pang of conscience. But he pulled himself together. Where do you suggest I go next? he asked. To the planet Earth, answered the geographer. It is highly regarded. And the little prince flew off, thinking about his flower. So the seventh planet he visited was Earth. Earth is no ordinary planet. It has a total of 111 kings. 7,000 geographers, 900,000 businessmen, 7.5 million drunkards, and 311 million show-offs. Altogether, about 2 billion grown-ups. To give you an idea of the size of Earth, let me tell you that before electricity was invented, it had to support, counting all six continents, a veritable army of 462,000 lamplighters. Seen from a certain distance, it created a marvellous effect. The advance of this great army was as precisely choreographed as a ballet. First on stage were the lighters in New Zealand and Australia. They then, having lit their lamps, went off to bed. Next to join the dance were the lighters in China and Siberia. Then, they too, slipped off into the wings. Next came the turn of the lighters in Russia and India, then there's in Africa and Europe, then there's in South America, then there's in North America, and not once did they come on at the wrong time. It was magnificent. The only lamplighter of the single lamp at the North Pole and his counterpart at the South Pole led easy, carefree lives. They only went to work. The little prince crossed the desert and came across only a single flower. A flower with three petals. An insignificant flower. Hello, said the little prince. Hello, said the flower. Where are all the people? asked the little prince politely. The flower had once seen some nomads go by. People? There are six or seven of them, I think. I saw them a few years ago, but you never know where they might be. The wind blows them about. They don't have roots, which causes them lots of problems. Hmm. Goodbye, said the little prince. Goodbye, said the flower. The little prince climbed to the top of a large mountain. The only mountains he had ever seen were his three volcanoes, which came up to his knees. He used to use the dormant volcano as a stool. From the top of a mountain as high as this, he thought, I'll be able to see the whole planet and all of the people. But all he saw were sharply pointed rocks. Hello, he said, just in case. Hello, hello, hello answered the echo. Who are you? said the little prince. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? answered the echo. Will you be my friends? I'm all alone, he said. I'm all alone. I'm all alone. I'm all alone, answered the echo. 
What a funny planet, thought the little prince. It's all dry and pointy and smells of salt. And the people have no imagination. They repeat everything you say to them. On my planet there was a flower, and she always spoke first. But finally, after walking for a very long time across sand, rocks and snow, the little prince came to a road. And roads always lead to people. Hello, he said. He was in a garden full of roses. Hello, said the roses. The little prince looked at them. They were all just like his flower. Uh, who are you? he asked in disbelief. We're roses, said the roses. Oh, said the little prince. He felt very unhappy. His flower had told him that she was the only one of her kind in the universe, and here were five thousand others, all just the same, in a single garden. She would be very upset, he thought, if she could see this. She would have a fit of coughing and pretend to be dying so that no one made fun of her, and, of course, I'd have to pretend to look after her, because otherwise, to make sure I was humiliated too, she really would let herself die. Then he had another thought. I believed I'd been blessed with a unique flower, but all I had was a common or garden rose to add to my three knee-high volcanoes, one of which may actually be extinct. That doesn't make me a very grand prince. And he lay down on the grass and cried. That was when the fox appeared. Hello, said the fox. Uh, hello, replied the little prince politely, but when he turned around he didn't see anyone. I'm over here, said the voice, under the apple tree. Who are you? said the little prince. You're very pretty. I'm a fox, said the fox. Come and play with me, suggested the little prince. I'm terribly unhappy. I can't play with you, said the fox. I haven't been tamed. Oh, I'm sorry, said the little prince. But after thinking for a moment, he added, What does tame mean? You're not from around here, said the fox. What are you looking for? I'm looking for people, said the little prince. What does tame mean? People, said the fox. People have guns, and they hunt. It's a real nuisance. They also raise chickens, and that's all they're interested in. Is it chickens that you're looking for? No, said the little prince. I'm looking for friends. What does tame mean? It's something most people have forgotten about, said the fox. It means creating a bond. Creating a bond? That's right, said the fox. Right now, as far as I'm concerned, you're just a little boy like a hundred thousand other little boys. I don't need you, and you don't need me either. As far as you're concerned, I'm just a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes, but if you tame me, then we'll need each other. You'll be unique to me, and I'll be unique to you. I think I understand, said the little prince. There's this flower. I think she tamed me. Quite possibly, said the fox. All sorts of things happen here on Earth. Oh, no, she's not on Earth said the little prince. The fox looked intrigued. On another planet? Yes. Are there hunters on this planet? No. Now, that is interesting. And chickens? No. Hmm, nothing's perfect, sighed the fox. 
but this made him think again. I live a dull life. I hunt chickens. People hunt me. The chickens are all alike, and the people are all alike, so I find it rather boring. But if you tame me, it'll be as if the sun has come out. Your footsteps will sound different from all the others. The others make me dive for cover, and yours will bring me out of my den, as if they were music. And look! You see those wheat fields over there? I don't eat bread, so wheat is of no use to me. Wheat fields mean nothing to me, which is a pity, but you have golden hair, so once you tame me, it will be amazing. The golden wheat will remind me of you, and I'll love listening to the wind blow through it. The fox fell silent and looked at the little prince for a while. Oh, please, tame me, he said. I'd like to, replied the little prince, but I don't have much time. I have friends to find and lots of things to get to know. You only know what you've tamed, said the fox. People no longer have time to get to know anything. They buy everything ready-made from shops. But since there are no friend shops, people no longer have any friends. If, if you want a friend, then, then tame me. Well, what do I have to do? said the little prince. You have to be very patient, replied the fox. First, you must sit quite a way away from me, about where you are now on the grass. I'll look at you out of the corner of my eye, and you'll say nothing. Talking causes misunderstandings, but each day you'll sit a little bit closer. The little prince came back the next day. It would have been better if you'd come back at the same time, said the fox. If, for example, you come at four o'clock every afternoon, at three o'clock I'll start feeling excited, the later it gets, the more excited I'll be. By four o'clock, I'll be in a state of anxious anticipation. I'll be discovering the cost of happiness. But if you come whenever you feel like it, my heart won't know when to get ready. It must be a ritual. What's a ritual? It's something most people have forgotten about, said the fox. It's what makes one day different from another one hour from another. Those hunters, for example, have a ritual. Every Thursday they dance with the girls in the village, so Thursdays are wonderful. <laughs> I can walk all the way down to the vineyard. If the hunters went dancing whenever they felt like it, no day would be different and I'd have no rest. So the little prince tamed the fox, and soon it was time for him to leave. Oh, said the fox, I'm going to cry. It's your fault, said the little prince. I didn't mean you any harm, but you asked me to tame you. That's right, said the fox. But you're going to cry, said the little prince. That's right, said the fox. So you're no better off. I am better off, said the fox because of the colour of the wheat. Then he added, Go and look at the roses again. You'll realise that yours is unique. When you come back to say goodbye, I'll let you in on a secret. The little prince went to look at the roses again. You're not at all like my rose. You're nothing yet, he told them. Because no one has tamed you, or been tamed by you. You're like my fox when I met him. He was just a fox, like a hundred thousand other foxes. But I made friends with him, and now he is absolutely unique. And the roses felt uncomfortable. You're all beautiful, but insignificant, he went on. No one would die for you. Of course, anyone he didn't know would think my rose was just like you. 
But she alone is worth more than all of you, because she's the one that I've watered. Because she's the one that I've covered with a dome. Because she's the one that I've sheltered with a windbreak. Because she's the one I've killed caterpillars for, apart from the two or three I left to become butterflies. <sighs> because she's the one I've listened to when she has had something to complain or boast about, even sometimes when she has nothing to say. Because she is my rose. And he went back to the fox. Goodbye, he said. Goodbye, said the fox. This is my secret. It's a very simple secret. Only the heart sees clearly. The eyes don't see what's important. The eyes don't see what's important, repeated the little prince so that he would remember. It's the time you spent on your rose that makes your rose so precious. It's the time I spent on my rose, said the little prince, so that he would remember. People have forgotten this simple truth, said the fox, but you must remember it. Whatever you tame, you're responsible for. You're responsible for your rose. I am responsible for my rose, repeated the little prince, so that he would remember. Hello, said the little prince. Hello, said the signalman. What do you do? said the little prince. Well, I sort passengers into groups of thousands, said the signalman. I send the trains, they're travelling on to the right or the left. And, growling like thunder, a fast train flashed by, making the signal box shake. They are in a hurry, said the little prince. Why? They don't know. Even the train driver doesn't know, said the signalman. And a second train thundered by in the opposite direction. Why are they coming back so soon? asked the little prince. They're not the same ones, said the signalman. They're changing places. Weren't they happy where they were? People are never happy where they are, said the signalman. Then a third train flashed by. Are they chasing the first group? asked the little prince. They're not chasing anything, said the signalman. They're asleep in there. Or falling asleep. Only the children press their noses to the windows. Only children know what they're looking for, said the little prince. They spend time on a rag doll, and it becomes precious to them. And if it's taken away from them, they cry. <sighs> they're lucky, said the signalman. And off he went to the next. Hello, said the little prince. Hello said the salesman. He was selling pills designed to quench the thirst. You take one of these per week and you no longer need to drink. Why are you selling those? said the little prince. They save a huge amount of time, said the salesman. Experts have worked it out. You can save 53 minutes per week. And what do you do with those 53 minutes? Well, anything you like. If I had 53 minutes to spare, thought the little prince, I'd walk very slowly towards a drinking fountain. Chapter 24 It was now a week since my plane had come down in the desert, and I had listened to the story of the salesman as I drank the last drop of water I had left. Yes, I said to the little prince, they're lovely your stories, but I still haven't mended my plane. I've run out of water, and I too would be very happy to be walking slowly toward the drinking fountain. My friend, the fox, he began. Look, little fellow, this isn't about the fox. Why? Because we're going to die of thirst. He didn't understand my argument, and said, It's good to have a friend, even if you're going to die. 
I'm very glad I had a fox for a friend. He doesn't realise the danger we're in, I thought. He's never hungry or thirsty. A bit of sun is all he needs. But he looked at me, knowing what I was thinking. I'm thirsty too. Let's find a well. I shrugged wearily. How ridiculous to think you will find a well in the middle of a vast desert. Nevertheless, we started walking. We walked for hours in silence, until night fell and the stars began to shine. I thought I was imagining them, being almost delirious with thirst. The little prince's words were dancing in my head. So, you're thirsty too? I asked him. But he didn't answer my question. He simply said, Water can be good for the heart as well. I didn't understand what that had to do with it, but I kept quiet. I knew very well there was no point in asking him to explain. He was tired and sat down. I sat down next to him, and after a while he spoke again. The stars are beautiful because of an invisible flower. I said, that's right and looked in silence at the way the sun rippled in the moonlight. The desert is beautiful, he added. And it was true. I had always loved the desert. You sit on a sand dune and you see nothing. You hear nothing, and yet there is something radiant about the silence. What makes the desert more beautiful, said the little prince, is that hidden somewhere in it is a well. To my surprise, I suddenly understood why the sand had this mysterious radiance. When I was a little boy, I lived in an old house, and it was said that treasure was buried beneath it. Of course, no one had ever been able to find it, or perhaps even looked for it, but it made the whole house magical. My house held a secret deep in its heart. Yes, I said to the little prince. Whether it's a house, the stars, or the desert, what makes it beautiful is, indeed, invisible. I'm glad, he said, that you agree with my fox. As the little prince fell asleep, I lifted him up and walked on, full of emotion. I felt I was carrying a fragile treasure. I even felt he was the most fragile thing on earth. I looked at him in the moonlight, his forehead pale, his eyes closed, his curly hair trembling in the wind, and I thought, what I see is only a shell. What is most important is invisible. His half-open lips seemed to be smiling, and I thought, what I find so touching about this sleeping prince is his loyalty to a flower to a rose whose image shines within him like the flame in a lamp, even when he's asleep. And that made him seem even more fragile. Lamps need protecting. A puff of wind can blow them out. And walking on, I found the well at daybreak. Chapter 25 People throw themselves into trains, said the little prince they've forgotten what they're looking for, and so they rush around in circles. Then he added, What's the point? The well we had come to wasn't like the Saharan wells. Saharan wells are simply holes in the sand. This one looked like a village well, but there was no village, and I thought that I must be dreaming. That's strange, I said. Everything's in place. The pulley, the rope, the bucket. He laughed as he touched the rope and spun the pulley. And the pulley squeaked like an old weather vane after a long wall. Listen, said the little prince. We've awoken the well, and it's singing. I didn't want him to strain himself. Let me do it, I said. 
is too heavy for you. Slowly I hauled the bucket back up to the mouth of the well. I secured it so that it hung straight. The pulley was still singing in my ears and the water still trembling. In it, I saw the sun tremble too. I need this water, said the little prince. Let me drink. And at that moment, I understood what it was he had been looking for. I lifted the bucket to his lips. He drank without even opening his eyes. It was like a silent celebration. The water had sprung from our walk beneath the stars, from the song of the pulley, from the effort of holding it up. It was good for the heart, like a gift. When I was a little boy, it was the lights on the Christmas tree, the singing at midnight mass, and gently smiling faces around me that gave my Christmas presents their radiance. The people on your planet, said the little prince, grow 5,000 roses in a single garden, but still they don't find what they're looking for. They don't, I replied. And yet, what they're looking for can be found in a single rose, or a mouthful of water. That's right, I said. And the little prince added, You don't see with your eyes. You must look with your heart. I had drunk. I was breathing easily. The sand at daybreak is the colour of honey. That honey colour too made me happy. So why did I also have to be sad? You must keep your promise said the little prince gently as he sat down next to me. What promise? You know, a muzzle for my little lamb. I'm responsible for my flower. I put my hand in my pocket and took out my sketches. The little prince caught sight of them and laughed. Your baobabs look a bit like cabbages. Oh, and I had been so proud of my baobabs. Your fox. Its ears. They look a bit like horns, and they're too long. And he laughed again. That's not fair, little fellow. I'd only ever drawn boa constrictors with and without their inside showing. Oh, it's all right, he said. Children understand. So I sketched a muzzle and my heart ached when I gave it to him. You're planning something, but you're not telling me, are you? He didn't answer. He said, You know, tomorrow, it'll be a year since I landed on Earth. There was silence. And then he added, I came down, just near here. And he blushed. And once again, without knowing why, I felt a strange sadness. But a question occurred to me. So, it was no accident that when I met you a week ago, you were here in the desert, alone, a thousand miles away from anywhere. You were going back to where you landed. The little prince blushed again. And I added hesitantly, Was it because... A year had passed. The little prince blushed once more. He never answered questions, but blushing means yes, doesn't it? Ah, oh, I said. Now I'm afraid. But the little prince replied, You have work to do. You must go back to your machine now. I'll wait here for you. Come back tomorrow evening but his words did nothing to reassure me. I remembered the fox. You are likely to cry a little once you have allowed yourself to be tamed. Next to the well were the remains of an ancient stone wall. On my way back the next evening, after finishing what I had to do, I saw my little prince standing on top of it with his legs dangling. And... Even from a distance, I could hear him talking. Nice deep breaths, remember? 
Don't you remember? He was saying. This isn't exactly the right place. Someone else must have replied to him, because he continued the conversation. No, no. It's the right day, but it's not the right place. I walked on towards the wall. I still couldn't see or hear anyone else, but the little prince responded again. That's right. You'll see my footprints in the sand. Just wait for me by the first one, and I'll be there tonight. I was twenty yards away from the wall, but I still couldn't see anyone. After a moment's silence, the little prince went on. Is your venom good and strong? You're sure it won't make me suffer too much? My heart froze, and I stopped in my tracks, but I still didn't understand. Now go away, he said. I want to get down. I too looked down at the foot of the wall, and I jumped. There it was, its head raised towards the little prince. One of those yellow snakes that can kill you in thirty seconds. Thrusting my hand into my pocket to grab my revolver, I sprinted towards the wall, but hearing me coming, the, sin the snake sank gently to the ground like a fountain that had been turned off, and quite slowly slithered between the stones with a slightly metallic sound. You are doing such a good job at relaxing. Just keep breathing. Keep being snuggly. I reached the wall, just in time to catch my little prince, whose face was as white as snow. What's going on? You're talking to snakes now. I had untied the golden scarf he always wore. I had splashed some water on his forehead and given some to drink. But I didn't dare ask him any more questions. He looked at me intently and put his arms around my neck. I felt his heart beating like a bird's before it dies, when it has been shot by a gun. He said... I'm glad you found what you needed to mend your machine. Now I'll be able to go home. But how did you know? I was just about to tell him that, much to my surprise, I'd managed to mend it. He didn't answer my question, but added, I'm going home today too. Then, in a sad voice, It's much further, and much harder. I knew something extraordinary was happening. I held him tight like a little child, yet he seemed to be slipping straight down into a chasm and there's nothing I could do to stop him. His face was serious and he was staring distractedly into the distance. I've got your lamb, and, and I've got its box and its muzzle. And he smiled sadly. I stood still for a long time. I could tell he was gradually recovering. You're frightened, little prince. He certainly had had a fright, but he laughed so gently. I'll be much more frightened tonight. Once again, my blood froze at the thought of something irreparable, and I realised I couldn't bear the prospect of never hearing that laugh again. A laugh that was like a fountain in the desert. Little prince, let me hear your laugh again. But he said, Tonight, it'll be exactly a year. My star will be directly over the place where I came down last year. Little prince, tell me I only dreamed the story about the snake and your meeting him under the star. But he didn't reply. He just said, What's important can't be seen. That's right. It's the same with my flower. If you love a flower that's up there in the stars, you enjoy looking at the night sky. Every star has a flower. That's right. It's the same with the water. The water you gave me to drink is like music because of the pulley and the rope. Remember how good it was? 
That's right. At night, you'll look at the stars. My planet is too small for you to see. It's better that way. For you, it will be somewhere amongst the stars. So you'll love looking at all the stars, and they'll be your friends. And I... I shall give you a present. He laughed again. Oh, little prince, little prince, I love hearing you laugh. Yes, it'll be my present to you, and it'll be like the water. What do you mean? The stars aren't the same for everyone. For some, they're guides to help them travel. For others, they're nothing but specks of light. For those who study them, they're a puzzle. For my businessman, they were lumps of gold, but for all of them, the stars are silent. Your stars will be like no one else's. What do you mean? When you look up at the night sky, because you know that I'll be somewhere among them, and I'll be laughing. For you, it'll be as if the stars are laughing. You, and only you, will be able to hear the stars laugh. And he laughed again. And when you get over your sadness, people always get over sadness. You'll be glad you met me. You'll always be my friend. You'll feel like, like you're laughing with me. And sometimes you'll simply open the window, just for fun. And your friends will wonder why on earth you're laughing at the sky. And so you'll tell them, Yes, the stars always make me laugh. And they'll think you're mad. I played a really good trick on you. And he laughed again. It'll be as if, instead of laughing stars, I'd have given you millions of laughing jingle bells. He laughed again, and then he was serious once more. Tonight, you know, you mustn't come. I won't leave you. It'll look as if I'm sick, almost as if I'm dying. That what that's what happens. I don't want you to see that. There's no point. I won't leave you. But something was worrying him. I say that partly because of the snake. I don't want him to bite you. Snakes are nasty. They can bite for no reason. I won't leave you. But something had reassured him. That's true. They don't have any venom left for the second bite, do they? That night, I didn't see him leave. He had slipped away silently. When I caught up with him, he was walking briskly and determinedly. All he said was, Oh, it's you. And he took my hand. But he was still worrying. You shouldn't have come. You'll get a, you'll get upset and it'll look as though I'm dead. But I won't be. I said nothing. You see, it's too far. I can't take my body with me. It's too heavy. I said nothing. It'll just be like an old shell that has been cast off. There's nothing sad about old shells. I said nothing. He was losing heart, but he tried again. It'll be gentle, you see. I'll be looking at the stars too. And every star will be a well with a rusty pulley. Every star will be a fountain that I can drink from. I said nothing. It'll be such fun. You'll have 500 million jingle bells, and I'll have 500 million wells. And he fell silent too, because he was crying. It's here. Let me go alone. And he sat down because he was frightened. And again he spoke. You know, my flower. I'm responsible for her, and 
and she's so fragile and she's so naive. She has four puny thorns to protect her against the world. I also sat down because my legs would no longer support me. He said, that's it. That's all there is to say. He hesitated only a moment longer, and then he stood up. He stepped forwards. I was unable to move. All I saw was a yellow flash near his ankle. He didn't move for a moment. He didn't cry out. And then he fell, gently, like a felled tree. There was not even a sound as he dropped to the sand. And of course, now, it is six years later. I have never told anyone this story before. When I got back, the other men were happy to see me alive. I was sad, but I told them it was because I was tired. Now I have more or less got over it. I mean, not completely, but I know he made it back to his planet because the next morning, his body was no longer there. It wasn't so heavy after all. And at night, I love listening to the stars. They are like 500 million jingle bells. But I must tell you something extraordinary. You remember the muzzle I drew for the little prince? Well, I forgot to add a leather strap. He would never have been able to put it on the lamb. So I keep wondering, what has happened up there? Maybe the lamb has eaten the flower after all. But sometimes I think, definitely not. The little prince puts the glass dome over his flower every night, and he keeps a close eye on his lamb. That makes me happy, and the stars all laugh so sweetly. But sometimes I think, we all get distracted now and then, and that's all it needs. One evening he forgot the dome, or else the lamb got out of its box, and then the jingle bells all turned to tears. It is one of the great mysteries. Those of you who love the little prince as I do will know that the whole universe is different according to whether, in some unknown part of it, a lamb we have never even seen has or has not eaten a rose. Look at the sky yourself. Has the lamb eaten flowers? Yes or no? And we'll see how everything changes. And no grown-up will ever understand how important that is. For me, this is the most beautiful and most desolate landscape in the world. It is the same landscape as the one on the previous page, but I've drawn it again to make sure that you've taken it in. I know that your eyes are closed, so I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> it's just two hills with a little star in the sky. It is the place where the little prince appeared on earth and then disappeared. Look closely at it to make sure you recognize it if you ever should go to Africa and find yourself in the desert. And if you happen to come across it, please, don't hurry. Stop for a moment directly beneath the star, and if a little boy comes towards you, as if he is laughing and has hair the colour of gold and doesn't answer your questions, you will know exactly who he is. If so, think of me and comfort me. Write to me at once and tell me he is back. And that, my love, is the end of The Little Prince. And now you need to sleep. Okay. Have a really and I have to